Genesis 22, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 24 here in this incredible chapter. Looking at Abraham's greatest test. So what was his greatest test? It's very simple. The Lord asked him to give up his son, his only son. Let's just read here this first verse. Notice he says, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took, his, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And we, interesting, we will come back to you. That was the statement of faith. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. So Isaac spoke to his father, to Abraham his father, and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. He bound Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, or literally Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So here is the story of God's request to Abraham to offer up his son, his only son. Now, this particular story, I believe, and the request of God here is the most supreme test that Abraham had ever experienced. And that's all that it was. It was only a test. And that is clear because God had before provided the ram caught in the thicket. And so clearly, this was a test of Abraham and his faith and his obedience. Now there are some Bible scholars today, those that you will hear on the radio, I shouldn't call them Bible scholars because they aren't. They basically say God doesn't ever test you. Now I don't know how you ever could get that out of the Bible when it says here in verse 1 and that God tested Abraham. So I don't know how people come up with these things. They, they aren't reading the same Bible I'm reading. God does test people. And he tests you continuously throughout your Christian life. 
And this is an issue that I think is so essential that, that you comprehend. This is the first mention of the word test in the Bible. This is the first mention because it is, well, I believe one of the most powerful truths found in Scripture in the prophetic Scriptures, revealing here God's plan to take a, a sacrifice instead of us. That's the bottom line. And so this test is here revealed. Now tests are always intended to cause you to grow. Every single test that God puts you through is to cause you to grow. Satan wants to test you to destroy you. That is his intent. With every single temptation he puts in front of you, he wants to destroy you. That is his sole purpose. But James tells us in James 1.3, he said, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And so God has a very specific purpose in testing us. It is not to destroy us. It is to strengthen us. Because that's what the word patience means. It means endurance, steadfastness. So God is testing us to bring us to a place of endurance, of steadfastness. He's seeking to establish our feet on solid ground and enable us to stand the greater tests that will come into our lives. God tested the children of Israel many times in many different ways. Two of the most important ways are found first in Exodus 15:25. This is after the children of Israel had journeyed three days after they had passed through the Red Sea. They'd seen the Lord open the Red Sea. They passed over on dry land. They come to the other side. They see the sea come in on their enemies, on, the, on Pharaoh and his men. They're drowned in the sea, and they are saved. They are delivered. And they sing this incredible song of deliverance and they go three days into the wilderness and there is no water. So it says there in Exodus 15, 25, they came there to the waters of Marah. Remember the waters were too bitter to drink. And this is what it says. They complained against Moses and against Aaron. So he, referring to Moses, cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. Can't say it any clearer than that. He took them into a place of lack, where they lacked their, the supply of something. And so God tests us with a lack of supply over and over again. We don't have what we need. And we think, where is it going to come from? And we're tested with what are we going to do in that moment. In the very next chapter, in Exodus 16, 4, there the people again are complaining against Moses and against Aaron because they don't have any food. So what happens now? It says there in Exodus 16, 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may, what? Test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. Because he told them, you can only gather so much. So now he tests them not with a lack, but he tests them with an abundance. So, you have both tests. And that is what takes place in every single one of our lives as well. You see, the Lord tests us when we don't have, and then He turns around and tests us when we have abundance. What am I going to do with my abundance, with all that He has given to me? Then in the New Testament, Jesus tested Philip and his decision. What would he do? Would he turn to God or would he not? 
in John 6, verses 5 and 6. They came to a place where they had no food. And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward them, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And so here, Philip is tested. So you see this whole process is found. It's all through the Old Testament. It's all through the New Testament. God tests his people. So are you in the midst of a test right now? If you aren't, just wait a day or two. You will have what we're talking about here today. You are going to be tested. It's going to come and you're going to go through that test. And the important thing is, is that you make it through the test, that you trust the Lord through the test. Because if you don't, you're just going to have to go through the test again. Now, the scripture is very clear that God tested Abraham at least twice over his lying, and he failed both times. Correct? The scripture says that the Lord tested, and we can see at least two or three times, when the disciples were tested over bread, whether they had enough bread, and they were tested several times on the sea as to whether they believed God was going to get them from one side to the other after he told them to go to the other side. So it is very clear that the Lord tests you again and again in the same place, in the same issue, to say, to see, okay, what are you going to do in that test? Are you going to trust him or are you going to trust yourself? Are you going to get through this successfully or do you have to go through it again? Because if you fail the test, you are going to go through it again. Even if you succeed the test, he may give you the same test just to develop and deepen your faith, your obedience in that very same area. So it's an issue that you, I want to succeed. I don't want to, I could take, the children of Israel could have taken 11 days to get from Egypt to the promised land. But they spent 40 years in the wilderness because they rebelled and they did not trust the Lord. So I don't want to spend 40 years in the wilderness. I don't want to spend all kinds of time going through the same stuff over and over again. I want to succeed in the tests that the Lord brings me into. He brings me into just as many tests as he brings you into. So you have to deal with them correctly. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So it's all these struggles that we go through in our lives, they're all common to every one of us. When you talk to somebody else and they say to you, well, you just don't know what I'm going through. That's not true. I do know what you're going through because I've gone through something similar to it, maybe not the same circumstances, but the same issues because they are common to man. I remember as a young Christian, I, you know, would talk to people and the, they would say, well, you're only 20 something years old. What do you know? I, I've, been a, I've been a Christian longer than you have. You don't know what you're talking about. And then I would talk to another individual and they'd say, well, you're not married, Steve. You don't know what you're talking about. If you were married, you'd know what, what it was all about. And then after I got married, then I'd talk to people and they go, well, if you had children, you'd, you, you, you'd know what I was talking about. And so it was always, I always kind of felt like, well, I, I just never quite arrived yet. And yet the reality is the counsel I gave all those people at the beginning of my Christian life is the same I would give them at the end of my life. 
because it's the Word of God. It's the same need that every one of us has. So I encourage you, don't tell that person that's trying to encourage you and counsel you they don't know what they're talking about. Don't tell me to trust the Lord. Have you ever said that to somebody when they're telling you to trust the Lord? Yeah. So I have two. And so it's very important that you realize this. Now, does God test because he doesn't know what you need? Or is the test for another reason? I think the test is not because God doesn't know. Okay? When, when you read these statements that now I know, well, this is so you know he knows. But the purpose of testing is primarily for you so that you will know. This is why the scripture encourages us constantly to examine ourselves. When we are in the midst of trial or struggle, why am I encouraged to examine myself, to check my own heart out? Because that's my greatest need, is to see where am I at? Am I really in the right place? Am I trusting the Lord? Am I obeying the Lord? Am I doing what I should do or not? Let me show you a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight and 31. In verse 28, he says, let a man examine himself. Now, this is what he's telling us to do during communion. That's the, one of the primary reasons for communion, is so we will examine our own heart. Why? So we will find out, am I in the right place? I should be examining myself every day. Verse 31, he said, if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And he goes on to say, when you're judged, you are chastened by the Lord. So if I don't want to be corrected by God, I need to examine myself so I can correct myself so I won't have to be corrected by God. Many of the temptations and trials and testings that the children of Israel went through brought incredible problems. They brought these problems on themselves. If they would have examined their own heart and said, you know, I shouldn't be complaining right now against God because God's the one that delivered me out of Egypt. God's the one that delivered me through the Red Sea. God is the one that provided the water. God is the one that provided the, the food that I need, the manna that I'm eating. Why shouldn't I trust him now to do what he's promised to do? And so, if they would have just examined their own heart at that time, they would not have received the correction that he sent upon them. 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Isn't that interesting? Paul says, test yourself. And that is what the test is primarily for is so that you will test yourself. You will stop and examine and say, you know what, I am not in a good place right now. I am angry, I am feeling very disobedient, I don't want to do what I, what I know I should do, and I need to get my heart right. If I have that kind of understanding, then I will make the change. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 5, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You see, God is constantly trying to point God's, his people back to examining themselves, considering their own ways, their own thinking, their own decision making, because he knows what he's going to do. I mean, just like he did with Philip, he knew exactly what he was going to do. That's what it, scripture tells us. He knew exactly what Philip was going to do, but he wanted Philip to see where he was going to put his trust and his thinking, and Philip did not pass that test. So very important principles, I think, you need to, to examine constantly yourself. So let's look at this particular test to Abraham in verses 2 through 14. The Many times Christians ask, they say, well, 
why would God ever ask this man to offer up his son? I mean, now wouldn't Abraham have thought, well, God, you're just like all of the pagan gods that ask for mankind to offer up their, their sons and their daughters on the altar. You're, just, you're no different than a pagan god. Now, yeah, Abraham may have thought that in the beginning. But God proved to him that that was not the case. Obviously, because God knew exactly what he was planning to do. By putting that ram in that thicket behind where the altar was, I mean, is that just a coincidence? I don't think so. God had this all planned out. And it was the request that brought this man to a place of complete surrender. Now, it's one thing to wait for a son for 25 years. Because that's how long he waited for this promised child. It's another thing. I mean, that was an incredible test, was it not? It's another thing to give up what you love the most. You see, this was the difference between holding on to a promise or versus letting go of the promise. You see, both are an incredible test of faith. And so basically, the Lord was dealing with Abraham in both directions. Have you gone through tests like that in your own life? Trusting the Lord for something and then the Lord saying, are you willing to give this up. I'll tell you, that is a a very severe test of your faith. And you've got to be willing to surrender. You see, this basically is a test that says, Abraham, are you all in or not? This is, I believe, the, the picture that is revealed in this test. And that is, The very same thing that God asked Abraham to do, he revealed he was willing to do. He was willing to go all in. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He gave his only son. He gave everything. He gave up, well, the most important treasure that he could give. So he was basically doing, and if that doesn't demonstrate to you that God is all in, all in to loving you and saving you, I I don't know what does. So it's a powerful demonstration. In Romans 12.1, he wants you to do the same thing. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I mean, is that a... Are those words just uh, by chance placed there? I don't think so. I think that this is all connected. Abraham's sacrifice, God's sacrifice, and now he says, I want you to sacrifice everything you have, present it all to me. Give it up. Give your life up. And Jesus said, if you aren't willing to to love me more than father, mother, wives, children, lands, and your own life, he said, you are not worthy to be a disciple of mine. So that's pretty clear. He's saying, are you all in? That's what he was asking Abraham. That's what he's asking us to do as well. So Romans 12, 1 is very clear. Now, the next thing I think that you should consider is when you read this phrase in verse 2, take now your son, your only son. That should be an immediate little red flag for you to make you stop and think, you know what? That's a very interesting term. Take now your son, your only son, and offer him up to me. Now that should just tell you 
this particular story is more than just a story and just a test of Abraham's faith and obedience. It is a test and it is a revelation, literally, that this, has, this story has prophetic significance. Now, what do I mean by prophetic significance? Well, this is one of the most important truths that we covered at the end of uh, Romans. <clears throat> Excuse me. Romans 16, verses 25 and 26. It says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. That's pretty powerful. The prophetic scriptures. You see, the Bible is filled with prophetic utterances. And if people don't understand that, they don't see that, they miss one of the most powerful truths that confirm to you that this is the Word of God. This story of Abraham offering his son is prophetic of God offering his son. And so that is the truth. Remember Jesus said, he described his own life prophetically as being revealed in the story of Jonah. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so the Lord will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus used the book of Jonah as a, the prophetic significance that it truly was intended to have. So all through the scriptures you see this use of a prophetic image used in the scripture. Now for him to offer up his son would have for Abraham been counterintuitive. Correct? Because to him, the Lord made promises to Abraham through Isaac, your seed will be called. Through Isaac, I will give you children as many as the stars of heaven, as many as the sand of the sea. So, how in the world can God give you many children if you're going to sacrifice him? It's totally counterintuitive. But the scripture tells us how Abraham dealt with this. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called. Verse 19, concluding. So this is what... Abraham concluded, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, the word figurative there is the Greek word for parable or parabole. And, and so it is basically, it, this is a parable. This is an illustration. This is an analogy. Now, where the Bible says there is an analogy, I have total freedom to say this is an analogy. Where the Bible does not say anything about an analogy, then I am not going to go there. But since the scripture says this, we can clearly say the story here of Abraham offering his son is a figurative example. It's an illustration and an analogy of what God intended to do. And so, in Abraham's mind, as he walked for three days to the Mount Moriah, his son was dead in his mind. And three days later, he was raised to life again. That is not a coincidence that it was a three-day journey from Beersheba to what 
where Mount Moriah is, which is present-day Jerusalem. That is where Mount Moriah actually is. So Isaac's question to Abraham and his response, verses 7 and 8, My father, he said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Now, you can take that in two ways. One, he's talking about the actual sacrifice caught in the thicket, but he is also talking in figurative language here, prophetically, about the lamb that would be provided on this very hill, many years later on that hill which is what we would call Golgotha the place of the skull so let me just show you this in pictorially okay so if you could put up the picture the first picture so this is the city of Jerusalem and this is taken this is the temple mount right here this is where the temple sat and this down here is the uh, Kidron Valley, and this picture is taken from the Mount of Olives. So this is the city of Jerusalem, and you can see obviously that it, it proceeds up. This hill right here is Mount Moriah. Now, off here in the distance, right up at the top of the mountain here, is the top of Mount Moriah. So, next picture. So this is a... This is the picture of the Temple Mount right here. The, we took this, the previous picture from right here, the Mount of Olives, looking over, and you can see this is a topographical map, and you can see that Mount Moriah actually ascends up to here, which is, do you see the name up there? Golgotha. So right up here is the, high, the highest point of the mountain. So... This is one large mountain here. Okay, next picture. So this right here is the place of the skull. Uh, this is the top of Mount Moriah. And this is, uh, this is a bus station uh, in present day uh, use. But this face of the skull, you can see the mouth right here, the two eyes obviously here. When, when did this take place? Well, this was cut out of the mountain in 66 BC so that they could better protect the city, the, the northern wall of the city of Jerusalem. Now, standing in this particular place, if you look directly behind you, next picture, this is looking back at the wall, and do you see this right here? This is bedrock right here. This is Mount Moriah, which actually filled in this spot, and you're standing, here's the bus station again, and right behind you is the place of the skull. So this right here is a part of Mount Moriah, bedrock. They built the wall to protect the northern part of this city. Next picture. This is a closer, uh, close-up picture. This is all bedrock, and this is the wall that was built along the top of this. This is Mount Moriah here. And it proceeded out all the way to where the place of the skull was. So when they dug this place out, the, the skull face was left there. So where was Christ crucified? On the top of Mount Moriah. This is where it says here, in the place, notice, go down to verse 14 of our study. Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, Mount Moriah, it shall be provided. Now that is clearly prophetic. He's talking about what will be provided one day on that very same hill. Now in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Now Solomon built, began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. 
So it's very clear this Mount Moriah is where the temple was built and on the highest part of that place, that's obviously where they did their sacrificing on the highest place. That's where they call it the high place. That's where Christ was most likely crucified. And right below that place of the skull, there just happens to be an empty tomb that is from the first century that has pillars, the remains of pillars from a first century church built over that open, empty tomb. There's a baptismal that has been cut into the, the bedrock. Obviously, first century Christians believe that this was a very special place. Right next to the face and the place of the skull. So this is why Abraham calls this place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. So this particular story has very powerful significance, prophetic significance. The Lord will himself provide the lamb. And did he? He did. He sent the perfect lamb of God. Remember John the Baptist said in John 1 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so on that mountain is where it all took place. It's interesting that the face of the skull, the place of the skull is still seen to this day. Isn't that amazing? I love that. And that particular place with that empty tomb before it is a testimony to all that God has provided. He has provided the lamb. He has taken away the sin of the world. So let's go on. Verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. He says it again. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now that's the key to this whole chapter. That little phrase right there. Because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. So because you have obeyed my voice. That is the key to this chapter. It's, it's really the key to dealing with the tests that come to your life. Will you hear his voice? Will you obey his voice? See, the word hear includes the idea of heeding. That is always the way the word hear is used in the Old and New Testament. Jesus clearly intended that when he spoke to his disciples about hearing his voice. It includes obedience. In Mark 4.24, Jesus said this to the disciples. He said, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. So if I want more given to me, I have to hear what he's telling me to do right now. And I'm telling you, this is something that is very important, I believe, in every single day. You know, the other day after our, um, our outreach in the park, I was absolutely whooped. I was so tired, I just wanted to go and crash. I was exhausted. 
And I'm driving down Grand Avenue, and here's a man sitting on the side of the road. And he's, he's going like this. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy is obviously in distress. And I went, well, Lord, help this guy. Send somebody to help him. <laughs> and I, I get about two blocks down the road, and he says, why don't you go back and help him? <laughs> and I said, okay, Lord, I will obey. I hear you. And so I flipped a UE, I turned around, and I came back, and somebody else had already got there before I got there and had somebody on the phone. They were calling for help for this guy. And I just pulled up and I said, can I help? And the guy goes, I got this one. And I thought to myself, okay, so why did you tell me to go back there? Why? Will you listen to me? Will you obey me? You see, I really believe it is that important. And there are so many aspects where the Lord speaks and he wants you to obey. Will you obey him? Will you hear him? If you want the Lord to speak and you want the Lord to direct you, then you've got to obey what he's telling you to do right now over whatever is going on in your life. In John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So this is how we follow him. This was the issue that God dealt with the children of Israel about. All through the book of Jeremiah, you will see this, this warning. God says, Obey my voice. Before I gave you my law, I said to you, Obey my voice, and you have not. And that is critical. If I want God's blessing, and that's what the Lord is promising here to Abraham. I mean, this second time he calls out to him from heaven, he says, I'm going to bless you with everything I have promised you. Why? Because you obeyed my voice. That's the key. It really is. I can't get around it. That's what takes your walk with the Lord from religion to real relationship. Because you're not just going through the motions doing what you please. You're saying, Lord, I want to hear your voice. I want to be obedient to you. I want to do what you command. And when you start doing that, you are going to hear more. You are going to be blessed by more. Now notice he says here in verse 18, he says, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Now obviously this is more than just his descendants. He uses the word descendants and you're in verse 17, your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemy. But he continues by saying, in your seed. Because he's not talking about just his descendants. He's talking about who? He's talking about Jesus. How do we know that? Because in Galatians 3.16, it says this. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, which is plural, as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. So he's saying, Abraham, not just to you, but to the Christ will all the promises be fulfilled. For in Christ, all the promises are yea and amen. Yes, so be it. So every promise God wants to fulfill in his people, it all comes through Christ. In Galatians 3.29, there he says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I'm an heir according to the promise because I am in Christ Jesus. And he is in me. And that's where the promises are fulfilled. So very important concept. Now last year, these last couple of verses that most people think, what is this here for? I'm just going to skip this. We're not going to skip it. There's, very, there's an important little truth here. Now it came to pass after these things 
that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. So notice it says here that people told Abraham, doesn't say who, but somebody told him, children are born to your brother Nahor. Why is that important? He says, Huz, his firstborn, Buzz, his brother, Kemuel, the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begat Rebekah. There is the purpose and why this is here. Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, his concubine, whose name was Rehama, also bore Teba, Gaham, Tehash, and Maaka. So why is this here? Well, here he is setting us up for Isaac's bride to be. Why is this here? He's telling you, look, the Lord is setting this whole scene up. He is providing for Isaac, his wife, Rebekah. So we get to this in, I think it's chapter 24, where Abraham sends his servant out to find a wife. And where does he send him? To his brother Nahor. So he sends him to receive this, this child, this wife for his son. So very important principle. God sets up this whole thing. He's working beforehand, before Abraham's even ready to, or Isaac's even ready for a wife. God is setting up the plan, which is exactly how he works in every single one of our lives. He is working beforehand, preparing beforehand, what I am going to need long before I ever get there. In Ephesians 2.10, it says there, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So He is preparing beforehand all of the circumstances of your life, he is preparing beforehand the job you're going to need, the spouse that you're going to need, the material things that you're going to need, all of the issues, all the trials, all the blessings that you're going to need. He's going to take care of all of that. He's working beforehand. So when you know that, you can rest. You can trust. Isn't that a comforting thing to realize that the Lord is working out all the details of my life and you say well boy I am in the midst of a really difficult time right now well the Lord has a way to get you through this he has a plan already worked out for you but the test is will you trust him to do it Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have our lives in your hand. You have it all worked out beforehand. Lord, there is nothing that comes as a surprise to you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to rest in that fact. To trust that, Lord, you are working and working it all out for our good. Lord, we, we don't see the good at this moment in so many things that are going on in our lives, in our families. But Lord, I know that your intention is to work it out for good. And so Lord, we, we just want to submit. We want to trust. We want to rest. Lord, we want to obey your voice. And so, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Help us to do it. In Jesus' name.